Senate Government Operations. It is Thursday, uh, February 11th. And um, we are looking today where our first um, agenda item is looking at the issue of juveniles and the release of the public exemption, public records exemptions for uh, certain information regarding uh, juvenile offenders. So um, I will just remind people that uh, we don't use chat in this committee because we consider chat as being um, like people having a sidebar conversation. And if we were in the committee room, we would ask people to go out in the hall and have their conversations. So if you need to chat with somebody, go out in the hall. Um, we don't use our chat. So with that, I think that we'll just get get started. We have um, we don't have a new draft. We had the draft that Tucker did for us last time, which we looked at, and we need to um, take more some more testimony. We were asked to look at um, the issue of how it might affect uh, licensing for daycares or child care centers. Um, driver's licenses, insurance, which is why we have a number of people with us here. And um, well, I think what I'd like to do is start with um, Marshall Paul, who, and um, there's also some confusion we had about the, the difference, what, what we have juveniles, and then we have youthful offenders. And there was some, um, <laughs> A confusion around that and I couldn't give a good explanation at all. So um, we have asked Marshall, Bryn Hare could not be with us today. She's the attorney that would deal with this, but Marshall is the um, juvenile public defender from the, I, I don't know, he'll tell us what his real title is. Um, and so Marshall, I think um, I'd like to start with you. Does it, do does any of the committee members have any questions before we get started about general, the way we're gonna proceed here? And then we'll go to the others to find out um, what the issues might be with their particular like DFR and um, DMV and DCF. Any okay. committee members? No. Okay. All right, so Marshall, do you wanna just then, um, have you seen the draft? Um, I was just looking for it. I heard the discussion of it last week, but it wasn't posted on the website, so I haven't seen it. And I was looking to see whether it was today, but I only have one computer in front of me, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna look at it right now because that would mean okay. looking away from Zoom, and I don't want to do that. But basically, what we're talking about is um, limiting identifying information of juveniles um, from arrest records and. Uh, yes, identifying information, and um, th and then when it goes to court, then the court becomes the custodian of it. So law enforcement. This is really about law enforcement at that point. Right. Okay. So I can start um, just by introducing myself. I'm Marshall Paul. I'm the chief juvenile defender and the deputy defender general for the state of Vermont, um, and. I'll start by giving sort of a quick overview of what youthful offender status is. And then I'll talk a little bit about how, um, how various uh, confidentiality provisions work around the youthful offender status and how they, how they can and can't work, sort of what the boundaries of confidentiality are constitutionally when it comes to youthful offender status. So youthful offender status is a status that's actually been around for quite a long time in Vermont. Um, almost all states have something like youthful offender status. It varies from uh, every state's youthful offender status is a little different, but most of them have a youthful offender type status at this point. Um, Vermont though was one of the first states to adopt a youthful offender status. And we did back in the, the late 90s or early 2000s. Um, and then we made, it, you know, that, that, that law has been tweaked along the way. And so what I'm gonna describe for you is sort of how it operates currently based on current law. 
Um, and so youthful offender status is a way for people whose case who are charged with offenses that um, could be in criminal court to have their case transferred down to the juvenile court, but give the court the opportunity and the prosecution the opportunity to sort of hold the criminal sanction, the criminal court um, system over that youth's head, uh, saying essentially, um, if you if you are a good supervisee, if you do a good job being supervised and being on probation, then great, you can essentially be treated as a juvenile. But if you screw up on probation, and if you're not a good supervisee, then your case can go back to the criminal court and you can be subject to a criminal sentence just like anyone in the criminal court system. Um, so it's sort of a high risk, high stake status for youth. Um, and when we say youth here, we're talking about kids uh, ranging, you know, it's possible that someone could be a youthful offender as young as 12 years old, but that's something that is typical. Um, most people who are in youthful offender status are somewhere between 16 and 22. Um, and so what happens is, let's say that you are, just to give an example, a let's say a 17-year-old charged with a fairly serious offense, like you're charged with, um, one of the most common ones is burglary of an occupied dwelling. Uh, that That's one that uh, kids get a lot, especially up in the northern part of the state where there's lots and lots of uh, hunting camps. Um, man, the number of kids who break into hunting camps during the non-hunting season is huge. And that that's, even though the hunting camps are not occupied at that time, because it's a, a building that can be occupied, that's considered burglary of an occupied dwelling. And it's a serious offense. It's a 15 year felony if it's charged in the criminal court. So if you're a 17 year old and you're charged with burglary of an occupied dwelling, that charge has to originate in the criminal court. It is presumptively an adult criminal prosecution. And there's one exception to that rule, but I'll, I'll get to that at the end because it's a very, very rarely used exception. So, but for the most part, 99% of the cases, that case has to originate in the criminal court. Then the youth can ask for youthful offender status, at which point their case is transferred to the juvenile division. And in the juvenile division, they hold a hearing to decide whether or not that youth should have youthful offender status. And really what they're looking for there is, is this, a, you know, is this a youth that's going to, where the interests of justice are going to be served by youthful offender status? It's a pretty vague way, you know, vague criteria, but what it actually boils down to in most cases are a few questions, which are essentially, um, does the court look at this kid and think this kid will be successful as a youthful offender? And there's a lot of factors that go into that. Is this a kid who has a record of being unsuccessful on juvenile probation? If it is a kid who's not, you know, who's failed juvenile probation a bunch of times, the chances that a judge is gonna let them take youthful offender status are pretty slim. Um, another one, and actually one of the ones that's most important is how much time is there for this kid to be supervised and how much time does this kid need to be supervised for? So for example, if it's a kid who was, let's say 20 years old uh, when they broke into a hunting camp and they asked to transfer their case down for youthful offender status. And when they're evaluated, uh, the state comes back and says, man, this is a kid with a serious protracted drug problem, they're like this case is, you know, what their treatment is gonna require is really seeing a period of intense drug treatment um, and followed by a period of supervision so we can tell whether this kid has really been successful in their treatment. And that may not be something that's possible in two years. And so we're gonna kick it back to the criminal court for that reason. That's probably the most common reason that these cases get kicked back up. Um, is just that there's not enough time to complete the treatment that is going to be required. So 
but let's say that, uh, you know, let's go back to our example of the 17 year old with the burglary of an occupied dwelling. Um, the kid doesn't have a bad record. The kid looks like he'll be a good supervisee. So then they get youthful offender status and they're put on juvenile probation, just like a juvenile. Uh, probation is supervised. You know, it's, it's written, the law is written as if it's joint supervision between, shared between DCF and DOC. But typically what happens if the kid's under 18 is that DCF takes the lead. And once the kid's older, then DOC takes the lead. Um, and so they're put on juvenile probation. They have juvenile probation conditions, just like anyone on juvenile probation. And they get, you know, regular meetings with their juvenile probation officer. They are doing treatment. They are doing, uh, you know, whatever it is that they need, counseling, treatment, community service, uh, paying restitution, whatever the parameters of their disposition, we call it in juvenile court rather than a sentence, is whatever the parameters of that disposition are, they're being supervised by a juvenile probation officer. If they violate their juvenile probation, they can be taken in on a VOP, just like a juvenile, normal juvenile probation case. And if the judge finds that they violated, the judge has a lot of options. The judge can uh, impose more conditions. Uh, so for example, for our, our example of a 17 year old kid who I uh, broke into a hunting camp. You know, maybe he had probation conditions that required him to meet with his probation officer and, you know, abstain from using drugs or alcohol. And if he's caught violating one of those conditions, let's say he vi violates the uh, drugs and alcohol condition, a judge could look at that and say, you know what, you need an, ad you need an additional um, condition, you need a curfew. So now you're going to have a curfew from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. every day, something like that. Uh, but another option that the judge has is to revoke probation completely. Um, and if the judge revokes probation, then the case gets sent back up to the criminal court. And in the criminal court, there's no trial or anything like that because the kid was already essentially found guilty in the juvenile court. Um, so they are sent up just for a sentencing. And it's an open sentencing, um, which is why even though youthful offender might sound from the outside like kind of a really good deal, it's actually a very high stakes status, a real risk. And there's a lot of kids who, even though they may be eligible for youthful offender status, I've had a lot of clients that I recommend that they don't take youthful offender status. And I'll explain a little bit why. So let's say that I have a 17-year-old who's charged with burglary of an occupied dwelling, that's a felony with a 15 year maximum on it, um, which means that in an open sentencing, a judge could sentence that kid to serve in prison anywhere from no time at all, all the way up to 15 years. It's a huge range. So it's an immense risk that that kid takes. Whereas if you plead, you know, if you work with a prosecutor and plead the case out, so if it's a case where there's no question of the kid's guilt, um, and the kid does not like the idea of the risk that's entailed, like, oh man, if I violate my probation and I get my probation revoked, I'm then just throwing my fate into the hands of the judge and saying, sentence me however you want. Um, and so what, what happens in a lot of cases when, when you, ex as a lawyer, when you explain to a kid that that's the consequence for violating or for getting your juvenile, you know, your youthful offender probation revoked, it doesn't seem like such a great deal, especially when the option is to plead the case out in the criminal court where you can actually be assured of what the sentence is. So for example, um, you know, you might work with the prosecutor and the prosecutor might say, oh yeah, it's only a kid. And I understand that this is not reflective of, you know, some long-term pattern of dangerous offenses. And so we can do, you know, three years all suspended, which would mean that the kid would be not sent to prison, placed on probation, and that if they violated their probation and had their adult probation and had their probation revoked, the most that they could do before they maxed out their sentence would be three years. Um, you don't have that option to negotiate a 
uh, you know, a controlled sentencing in the youthful offender system, which is why it's something that, while it's used a lot in, and used in some serious cases, when I have a kid who has a history of being a bad supervisee, um, I tend to recommend to those kids, like, look, let me just work out the best deal that I can for you in the adult system, rather than bringing you down here, where if you get revoked, which given your history is not at all unlikely, um, you could be facing this sort of immense uncertainty as to your sentence anywhere from zero to 15 years. You know, and as, a, as an experienced lawyer, you can give a kid some advice like, you're not likely to get, as a 17-year-old tagged in your first offense, you're not likely to get any, like, you know, you're not going to get a 12-year sentence out of that. It would be something less than that. But nonetheless, that uncertainty, that huge range of uncertainty is really difficult for kids. And um, in a lot of cases, not going youthful offender is actually the right approach. So that's sort of, the, I told you that I was going to talk about the one exception to the rule that these cases must start in the criminal division. Um, and that one exception is that prosecutors do have the option to directly file a case as a youthful offender case. So rather than filing it in the criminal division, they can file it in juvenile court as a youthful offender status case. The trick with that is uh, there's really a, two, two tricks to that. One is it's an option that's not used very often at all. Like, um, you know, 99% of cases that go youthful offender started in the criminal division and then were transferred down. Very few prosecutors are direct filing these as youthful offender. Um, and part of the reason for that is that it's not actually up to the prosecutor whether the case goes youthful offender or not. Even if the prosecutor wants the case to go youthful offender, sort of as I just explained, there's a lot of drawbacks to youthful offender. And so the, the youth can reject the youthful offender status even if the prosecutor has offered it up. Um, so those are, you know, those are really the reasons why that one sort of narrow exception to the general rule that these cases must start in the criminal division are actually pretty few and far between. I would say that the one exception to that is Chittenden County seems to be filing a lot of cases as direct file youthful offender cases, um, but the other counties not so much. So then we get to the question of confidentiality and the way that youthful offender has worked, uh, Senator White, you look like you were about to interrupt me and say something. Well, I was just, I was just going to, um, the, the area, the only area, we're not dealing with the court cases at all here. Right. O only at the uh, point of arrest and um, what that entails, um, because, and, and I, you, if you can just clarify for this for me. So when, Sheriff Anderson arrests somebody. There is no charge yet. He he arrests them. And then so at that point, they don't know if they're going to be a youthful offender, go to criminal court, go to family court, whatever. So if you can talk about how the how our proposal here would affect the youthful offender status. Is that where you were going? I'm sorry. Yeah, I think I can go there. And so just remind me a little bit. I think the proposal was essentially to say that on anyone under age 19, um, that their identifying information couldn't be released as an arrest record. Yes. Right. And, and Jeanette, could I just tag on to your question? Mm -hmm. Because it's puzzling. Uh, Marshall, once they get to criminal court, I mean, we're trying to affect this book. Is my... Uh, we're trying to affect this before it gets to criminal court because that's a public record that is totally public at criminal court so what we're trying to do is circumvent the pub the the publicizing of juveniles names under 19. But, right? it, assuming that, yeah assuming so I, that, but, yeah so i don't even want them to get to criminal court yet because that would mean well, that they were totally exposed and identified we have we will have no control over whether they go to criminal or family court that's not our right. that's not our question right our question but, ha, well, that's that's right our question is 
identifying somebody under, and right now juvenile is 19. It's gradually gonna move up. So as we identify juveniles at a certain age, right. our, what should we be putting in an arrest record that is public that um, might impact them at a future date? Senator Collimore. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, Marcia, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, you, know, you said something and I'm, I'm confused now. If Mark Anderson arrests someone, there has to be a charge, doesn't there? They have to be arrested for some reason. Um, I don't know how that's written up. He's arrested for breaking into it, but there is no charge yet by the court. Is am I, uh, Marshall? Maybe you can. I can. I can answer that a little bit, and perhaps Sheriff Anderson can provide uh, further. So when when it when someone's arrested, child, adult, anything. They're arrested because the arresting officer has probable cause to believe they committed an offense. That's not the same as a charge. And ultimately it's the prosecutor who determines the charge. So just to use the example of our kid who's caught breaking into a hunting camp, uh, the arresting officer might say, I'm arresting this kid for burglary of an occupied dwelling, which is a presumptively criminal charge. But when that uh, affidavit is passed on to the prosecutor, the prosecutor might look at it and say, you know what, I don't see evidence in this affidavit that the kid intended to commit an offense. Uh, and therefore, I'm not going to charge burglary of an occupied dwelling. And instead, I'll charge unlawful trespass, um, which is a then that's a juvenile offense, which would not be in the criminal court. And in fact, because it's a misdemeanor, not even eligible for transfer up to the criminal court. And so that's that's the that's that, that's that's my understanding of it essentially is that you know when the when the officer writes up the affidavit, they indicate in the affidavit, I arrested because I believe that there was probable cause that this kid had committed a particular offense. But that doesn't, you know, the prosecutor can then decide to charge that however they want, or honestly, that they can decide not to charge it at all. Um, and so you often see a case, you know, when you do arraignments, you, you're often seeing cases where the charge, you know, the charge that's brought by the prosecutor may say one thing. And when you look at the affidavit and see what the arresting officer believed there was probable cause for, that might be something else entirely. And those decisions are are made in a lot of different ways. I mean, you know, prosecutors can decide what charges to file, not just based on what the evidence is. You know, they might say, I'm looking at this and it looks like it could be charged as a burglary of an occupied dwelling. But just given this kid's background and history and things that the prosecution knows about the case, they might feel that's not appropriate to expose that kid to that serious of a charge. Um, and they might, you know, elect to charge a lesser offense. So, Mark, do you want to weigh in on that? Is that the way you see that it happens? Uh, thank Anderson, you, Madam maybe? Chair. For the record, Mark Anderson, Wyndham County Sheriff. Uh, I know that there's certain words that we are talking about that are uh, referenced legally. So I, I generally agree with uh, Attorney Paul. Uh, the law enforcement will recommend to the state's attorney uh, charges. Uh, ultimately, the state's attorney uh, will draft a complaint as well as uh, information which will include those charges. Uh, they could also uh, find uh, that we haven't uh, reached probable cause for a charge uh, as attorney Paul has mentioned. So generally I agree, but there's also attorneys in the room who might have a better understanding of the different words at different points in the process. So if, if we said something like, I, I guess I want to try to get us to the, um, what we're trying to do here, is if we said an unidentified youth was arrested for breaking and entering uh, at, on Pond Road on December 23rd at 2.30, that's the arrest record. We don't say Joe Smith or a black male teenager or a... Um, female uh, from the town of Putney 
we, we say unidentified youth is arrested for potentially this charge. I mean, is that, does that cause a problem, I guess, is the issue that we're trying to address here. Uh, thank you for that, Madam Chair. I don't, generally, I don't think that uh, causes an issue. I think uh, prior to some, some changes uh, uh, with the youthful offender law, uh, that was generally how law enforcement would represent this issue. Uh, our practice uh, within my department is to uh, just reference a juvenile was, was arrested, uh, if that mm -hmm. was the case. Uh, we don't identify gender, sex, uh, we do identify age, uh, simply to say it was a 16 year old versus a 13 year old. I mean, there's, there's a difference uh, with regards to that, um, which I don't think would be necessarily identifying. Uh, as we get to locations where they could become identifying, uh, we generally will sanitize a press release uh, or public release of that. Uh, again, because we don't want it to be identifying uh, and that's ultimately the intent. Uh, the concern I would have is uh, the circumstance where we're not sure if we're filing charges, um, where uh, let's say that it's a juvenile operating a motor vehicle in a potentially, uh, in a negligent way, is it to the level of criminal negligence versus ordinary negligence. And so we're asking for an attorney's review of documents uh, to verify if probable cause exists for the criminal charge. If we received a public records request before the charge was filed with the state's attorney or by the state's attorney, are we still uh, covered by this exemption? I think that that's that's our point. Is that we want we want there to be, um, or uh, some of us want there to not be a release of any identifying information until it gets to the court, and at the court, then the decision is made whether it goes to family court or criminal court. And at that point, if it goes to criminal court, it's all public. But if it goes to juvenile court, it's a little bit um, beyond, a little bit uh, silly to have um, released the information beforehand that's out there. And so it's out there. And then, and then it's decided that it should go to juvenile court where it's all confidential when it's already been released. Madam Chair, I agree. Uh, I think it would be simpler. Uh, and there, there might come a point where ultimately a court of competent jurisdiction or a state's attorney provides notice that they will not be pursuing it. Maybe that could be an avenue out upon the, the receipt of notice that it is not going through a criminal process. Then that could be subject to public records. No, but why would you want it to be a public record if there was no charges brought? Yeah. I think that's a question for people who support the Public Records Act, uh, but I would argue that uh, there will be people who are saying for the purpose of transparency. Yep, I, I agree that there will be um, uh, a difference of opinion here on all of this. Senator Colomore. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just so I'm clear, and I did get a lot of pushback since our last get together, uh, mostly because of the editorial that was in the local paper here. Mm -hmm. So if someone is, 18 years and 364 days old, they would, they are considered uh, a youth uh, or a juvenile. Juvenile. Once they turn 19, we're not talking about them with this bill because it all is public, correct? I'm getting- I can, If I can just answer that it. quickly. The yes, answer yes. is yes. Once they turn 19, they're no longer a juvenile. In 2022, the age of juvenile jurisdiction is going to uh, adjust upward once more. And so then 19 year olds will be considered juveniles. There's no more, uh, the age is not get set to go up further than that. That was the way that that bill was written, the raise the age bill. It was, uh, a, it was simply an increase of two years from age 18 to age 20. Um, so not including, when I say to age 20, it's always confusing. It's not 20 year old. So it's up until the 20th birthday. On the 20th birthday, uh, they will become an adult uh, in the eyes of the juvenile justice system. Um, and that was phased, that was implemented in two phases. So the first phase went into effect this year. 
the second phase goes into effect in 2022. Understood. Thank you. So if you don't, you don't say any age in something like this, you just say a juvenile, and that'll depend on the definition of juvenile in the court system, in the statutes. Yeah. Marshall? I would recommend not using the word juvenile because the word juvenile okay. has a lot of different meanings depending on which chapter of state law you're looking at. Um, what would you use? You know, I think just putting in the age 19 and then uh, 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 up until their 20th birthday. Oh, no. Yeah. Now you would put up until their 19th birthday and then you would put in a clause that it goes up to their 20th birthday when 20th, in 2020. What? Were you saying something, well, they're, Senator Carson? Yeah, they're 19 all the way through until their 20th birthday. So it, it has to be clear that it's not just, it's their entire 19th year. Yes, that's the way that, I mean, we can use the language from the, from the, the, the raise the age statute. That's, and so in 2022, it would be up until their 20th birthday. And we actually have in the juvenile uh, chapters in several different places at this point, just because we reference these ages all over the place. Um, we figured out how to draft the statutes. It's really Bryn Hare has figured out how to draft the yeah. statutes so that they automatically adjust. It's essentially passing two different statutes, one of which is effective uh, on passage and then the next one is effective, uh, it would be on July 1, 2022. So do any, oh, I'm sure, sorry, Marshall. So I just wanted to kind of chime in with the, because uh, we got a little sidetracked and I had been going to answer the question of what would this, what effect would this proposal have around youthful offenders? And it would be, it would work fine. It would do exactly what I think it's intended to do. Um, the one thing it could do is there would be places where uh, youth are, where people who are over the age of, at this point, 19, who are still eligible for youthful offender status, um, could still have their arrest records public, but then get youthful offender status where their case then becomes, uh, confidential. But I, you know, in my opinion, that's not actually a big deal because, um, for 99% of these cases, they're going to go through criminal court anyway. And so that affidavit, that information, that's all gonna become public record anyway. So it's not costing anybody any confidentiality, um, even though this doesn't capture the entire world of people who can find themselves in a confidential court proceeding. Those ones who it doesn't capture are already exposed in other ways for the most part. So I certainly have no objection to the way that this has been drafted and the, the, you know, the intent of this. And I think that it works fine with the youthful offender law. Um, I actually think that the way that this has been proposed to have it essentially be that we just say arrest records are of kids under the age of jurisdiction are confidential. And then they become the essentially the courts become the custodians of it. And if the case ever becomes non-confidential, then the arrest record can become non-confidential through the court system is a really good and actually really creative way to address this issue. That's our Tucker. Any questions for Marshall? Senator Rahm? Well, I don't think this is necessarily a question, but I was really grateful to Marshall for some email back and forth just about how racial disparities can, will just end up having some unintended consequences here. I wouldn't change anything about the bill, but I just want to name that when there is discretion, it we've seen in the numbers that it's just more likely that, you know, black youth will be charged and maybe potentially charged in a higher level court that becomes public. So I think Unfortunately, what we will still see is that black youth will still have more of a public visibility for the crimes that they commit that are similar to white youth. 
one of the statistics that Marshall shared with me that I found really compelling, even though it still would count them as a youthful offender, is that Black youth in Chittenden County make up two and a half percent of the population and 25 percent of the youthful offenders. So the statistics are really jarring and I just hope we'll continue to watch the overall issue of who's being advanced to criminal court, who's having their information shared publicly and being seen as a visible criminal versus who gets the benefit of the doubt that they're young and, and made a mistake. So I just want to name that before we move on. Yeah, and, just, and I, I just go ahead, Marcia. Clarify that statistic a tiny bit. It's like the most minor point, but I try to be precise with statistics is um, <laughs> I actually don't know, I could not, I've not been able to find data on the percentage of youth in Chittenden County who are black. So that's actually the percentage of the population of Chittenden County that's black. I couldn't find okay. anyone who broke it down. I found I found I found statistics where they break down the population of Chittenden County by age and by race, but none that combine the two. Um, so I'm not actually I would imagine that if you were looking only at say the under 19 population of Chittenden County, the percentage of youth that are black would be a little higher. Exactly. Just yeah. because anecdotally, observationally, um, it, you know, there's it, it's a lot of a lot of the black population in Chittenden County is driven by the refugee population, mm -hmm. and it's been a lot of that's a it's a population that's been growing, and it's a lot of young people. Um, whereas when you look at the white population in Chittenden County, it's a lot of older people. So I think that if you looked only at the youth population, you would see a bit more diversity than you see when you look only at the older population. Mm -hmm. But like I said, that's anecdotal and observational. I don't actually have a statistic for and that. And even if it was just double rather than 10 times, it's, it's pretty jarring regardless. So other questions for Marshall at this point? Thank you, Marshall. Thank you. So um, let's jump here. Does it, first of all, does anybody else who's with us have a, a time constraint? I see, uh, because I, I'd like to make sure that we get to everybody, but I, I know that um, everybody is pretty busy these days. Um, does anybody have a time constraint then would like to go first? I don't see anybody. Um, in that case, I think we will um, jump to, because there were some very specific questions about how it would impact um, insurance, motor vehicles, um, uh, licensing. So I think we'll jump to uh, Commissioner Pichek first, if that's okay with everybody. And Commissioner Pichek, I will say that we um, enjoy as the, wrong word to use because we would rather not see you be give see you giving these um updates every every few days but um you're doing a good job so thank you well uh thank you very much uh, chair white and thank you um to the committee for uh, inviting me here today uh, as well good to see everyone so um i believe there were some questions and during your last testimony about the impact of the proposed bill on insurance um, mm -hmm. And I've been listening to the testimony this uh, this afternoon, and if I have the um, the nuance right, that you're talking about initial arrest records, not the eventual conviction of an individual that's under a certain age, uh, yes. that, that would stay the same. So, you know, in that case, um, you know, an insurance company certainly would make a determination about driving record, driving history, um, certain types of um, arrests that are connected to driving. Uh, and that would definitely have an impact on somebody's driving uh, premiums. But those would be based on convictions. Those wouldn't be based on initial arrests. I mean, uh, certainly due process of the law requires, you know, that those, um, that the evidence be presented, that, you know, defenses be made and that um, an individual be convicted before they see even those kind of, you know, non-governmental uh, impacts. So if it is simply initial arrests and then the process plays out, you know, as it would in criminal court, if it's determined that it should be in criminal court, or if the process goes to juvenile court and it plays out as it is now, you know, it really should have a, I wouldn't even say negligible, it should have pretty, it should have no impact on, you know, on auto insurance rates. Um, 
either for those that are uh, under 19 or those that are you know generally in Vermont. Thank you. That was pretty concise. Any questions for Commissioner Pichek about that, Senator Colomar? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure I understand, Michael. Um, so, does the insurance company eventually gain access to a driving record of a juvenile or not? Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's actually one I was asking myself uh, while you were uh, speaking because I believe, um, you know, if those records are sealed and they're not reported on the to the DMV, then the insurance company wouldn't have any way of accessing them. Um, you know, if they are, um, if they are in a, a you know, if it's in a criminal proceeding, obviously, of course, they would have access to those. Right. So they wouldn't be able to uh, offer any uh, discounts or anything like that with a safe driving record if they couldn't access the records. I, I think Marshall might have a, okay. an answer for us. So two things on that. One is that um, this wouldn't affect, as I understand it, uh, traffic tickets, which make up most of a, a driving record. Um, you know, I think a lot of us have I'm speaking really for myself here, I have a lot of traffic tickets, um, but no, I don't have any convictions for traffic offenses, uh, just a lot of tickets. Um, and tickets are handled by the Judicial Bureau, they don't involve an arrest, uh, and the Judicial Bureau is not confidential for juveniles, for adults, for anybody, that's, Judicial Bureau is all public. When it comes to uh, traffic crimes that can be prosecuted and brought in either the by uh, criminal or the juvenile division, there's actually a provision and it's kind of hidden. It's not in the juvenile code. It's actually in title four. And I don't, I want to say it's in title four, section 33, but I'm doing that off of my pop memory. So I might be a little off there. Um, it's the, it's the section of title four that deals with the jurisdiction of the juvenile courts, um, has a provision in it that says that the juvenile courts can forward records of conviction of convictions for traffic offenses to the Department of for Motor Vehicles. Um, I understand that it's not always clear what DMV does with those, but uh, they are, there is already a mechanism to pass that information to the Department for Motor Vehicles. So if somebody was um, stopped and given a ticket for speeding on 91, that, that's public anyway, but there's no charge there. It's just a ticket. Right. Yeah, okay. S Senator Clarkson. Uh, don't accumulated speeding tickets have an impact on your uh, insurance rates, Michael? Yeah, for sure. I mean, even yeah. even uh, even yeah. a, a single ticket, even a single ticket could. Uh, but this so it is isn't just it isn't just convictions that that affect your insurance rate. It's 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 a certain amount of speeding tickets as opposed to parking tickets. I mean, you don't get docked for parking tickets. Right, so I think, but you get I think the point- get docked for speeding tickets. Yeah, and I think the point there is, you know, when you're, when you have the speeding ticket and you decide not to contest it, you know, it's not an arrest, it's not an arrest, uh, you're not being arrested and then you're sort of, consent. you're sort of agreeing to the violation or you're consenting to the violation. So, so I think in that instance, if you think of that as a, as a, um, you know, as a whether it's a conviction or whether it's basically, uh, you know, a complete um, completion of that process that you've you've exhausted your appeal rights or you've you've agreed to the the charge as made on the ticket, then uh, it's complete and it's on your record. But but I don't think that that we're not dealing with traffic with right. uh, violations of that nature in this bill. We're dealing with charges, people who are arrested. People aren't arrested for speeding. They might be arrested for going 110 in the wrong lane, which would be then a different charge, not just a speeding ticket. Right. So we're not dealing with tickets here. I, I understand that, but they do have impact. Right. Right, but we're not- uh, They do have there. impact on your insurance rates is the only point. Right. So it's not right. just convictions. Right, but we're not addressing no, that I, at all. That's right, not. I know. Okay. Any other questions for Commissioner Pichek? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. 
So I think the other question that was asked was, um, would it have any impact on, uh, I suspect the answer is gonna be the same on these, um, for um, licensing through OPR. So Lauren? Good afternoon. For the record, Lauren Hibbert, Director of the Office of Professional Regulation. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to come testify on this issue. Um, so we do ask on every application in our office um, if you have been convicted of a crime. Um, and based on my knowledge, I used to be a public defender in New York City. I'm, I have never practiced criminal law in Vermont. Um, so I want to preface it with that. But um, based on my information, um, a person charged as a juvenile would not have to disclose that they were convicted under their youthful offender status or their juvenile delinquent status. Um, that is not to say that we do not receive responses to that question that indicate that someone had a juvenile record because people do not understand um, the distinction there. And as a matter of policy, we do not consider anything that is disclosed to us that happened when somebody was a juvenile um, or under the age of 19 at this time, um, soon to be 20 when the law changes. Um, when we, we have a few select professions that we um, are authorized by the legislature to conduct uh, criminally supported background checks for, there's four of them. We only conduct criminal background checks of on three out of the four, um, just as a quick overview, that is um, PI and security, uh, real estate appraisers, osteopathic physicians, and nurses. Uh, nurses, we do not currently conduct background checks for. We have the authorization, but we haven't started doing that um, criminally supported background check, Think fingerprint supported um, background check yet. Um, and my understanding of this bill is we would not receive the records if the person had not been uh, referred for prosecution under fingerprint analysis either. And that is fine uh, for the Office of Professional Regulation. I, I don't believe we're receiving them now when a juvenile is fingerprinted, but I could be wrong. Um, on whole, uh, the Office of Professional Regulation Office of Professional Regulation does not have any policy objections to this bill. Um, and we believe that we'll be able to continue our work uh, safely uh, if this bill were passed. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to it. Any questions for Lauren? Senator Colomar? Thank you. Um, so I just want to understand, Lauren, if someone is 17 and they've been convicted of a felony, you don't nor you would not get that information on their form. Is that what you're saying? If they were, to be clear, if they were convicted of a felony in criminal court, we would receive that response yeah. and we would take that into consideration. It's the things that we do not take into consideration are convictions of a juvenile delinquent or a youthful offender. But someone who is charged in criminal court, um, we would be asking, do you have a conviction? Um, you, have you been convicted of a crime? The answer would be yes, we would receive the information and we would um, take that into consideration um, in okay. making our licensing determination. So even if they didn't self-report that they were, you would still get that report from the courts? So if the, if the, it is a profession where the, we receive a criminally, you know, a fingerprint background check, then we will get that information from that avenue we do not do a criminal court search on every licensee that we license in the state. Um, a lot of our licensees actually um, are not from Vermont or, or have a limited exposure of time in Vermont. So the Vermont criminal court search is not um, indicative of whether or not somebody has been convicted of a crime. It only tells us whether or not they've been convicted of a crime in Vermont. Um, but we do find that people lie to us, um, people being people. And when we find that someone has lied to us on the application saying that they were not convicted of a crime and in fact they were, then we bring um, a case involving professional um, misconduct charges, unprofessional conduct charges. 
Okay, I guess I'm still not clear. If somebody on their form said no, but they had been, there could be a case where you would never know that. That is correct. But, but this is after a conviction. This isn't at the arrest point, right? You don't, you don't ask if people have ever been arrested. We do not ask that on our standard application. There are, um, I believe in PI and security, we ask that question, have you ever been arrested for anything before? But not in our standard application. Um, we do not ask that question. Okay, thank you. We do ask if anyone has any pending arrests currently, but the majority of, not have you ever been arrested in your life, but I do have a pending arrest. And we do ask that question um, but the majority of our professions require that you be over 18. Um, and I would argue that that, um, that is important to protect public safety. Um, I haven't thought through candidly whether or not this would be a bar. This is, I don't think this would be a bar from us asking that question of someone who was under 19. It would be a, a bar on us asking for the record independently of the court or of the arresting agency is my read of the law. It's not that the person themselves does not have, could not answer that question. Thank you. Any other questions for Lauren? Thank you. Thank you very much. So Tyler, I think the question here, are you, yeah, you're here. I think the question for DCF was, would this, um, impact you do licensing for child care centers um would this have um a negative impact on your ability to um function and uh license people uh for the record tyler allen uh dcf family services division um thank you for the question madam chair uh, i'm actually realizing i hadn't I hadn't prepared for that particular question. <laughs> um, that would be through our, our licensing uh, unit and I am, uh, I'm our adolescent services unit. So uh, in, in, in order to get a specific answer to you, I think I would have to return or, or submit something uh, by email in the interim as for an answer to that question. I think I had prepared to uh, speak to what Marshall Paul already so eloquently um, and comprehensively covered. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, great. Sorry for the confusion. That was my fault. Um, any questions for Tyler? Okay. Um, are there, were there any other <coughs> um, agencies here that I don't think so? I think that was the list that we asked to come and testify to. And I do see that we have um, Mike Sherling and uh, Pat Gable and David Scher and James Pepper. So how, um, who wants to weigh in now? Should we start with the commissioner? Uh, happy to Madam Chair. I think I'll be uh, super brief. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a current version of what you're working on. I've uh, my navigational abilities on the website are failing me. Um, the, uh, I think largely the, uh, as crafted, uh, this works for us. Um, as, as you'll recall, we didn't have a specific position. We were just looking for clarity. Uh, the only flag, and I don't know whether this is addressed or not, um, or if it would be restricted based on the current language, but in the event there is a public safety threat, we, um, would need, we think we need the ability to um, publicize that. So in other words, a fugitive who happens to be a, uh, a juvenile or um, uh, a person identified under this new construct uh, that, that poses an articulable risk to the public, we'd wanna be able to publicize uh, that as we search for that person. I, I think that that did come up last time and um, I don't, it wasn't incorporated, but I think that that committee, um, does that make sense to you? I mean, I, yes. And, and there was the same question about Amber alerts and I don't understand how it would impact that because there it isn't the person that's being, um, arrested, looked for as an offender, but a victim. So 
this is an arrest record. Yeah, again, I don't have the language, but uh, at, you know, as you deliberate and look at the final language and work with uh, legislative council, um, if that lens could be brought to bear just to ensure it's not restricting that, um, that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Senator Clarkson. So, uh, Michael, uh, why does that, I mean, unless you're asking the general public to help on a search, uh, if you're just asking uh, emergency services and public safety personnel to search, surely then the name doesn't need to be public. It just needs to be contained within those professionals. Uh, are Correct. you talking about a public there search? Are, there are very rare, um, but they do, they do occur a couple of times a year, instances where there are uh, people that pose an imminent risk to the public um, even more rare that they're juveniles, but again, it does occur. Uh, so we just want to make sure there isn't a restriction in the event that someone is at large and poses a risk. Um, I think uh, someone who's threatened a school shooting and we can't locate them. Yeah, um, no, I'm, being I, able I'm just to, trying to differentiate them. Right. That's all. I, again, rare instances, but uh, an, an important, uh, albeit rare, uh, need for that carve out. I think Thanks. the example that was given to us was um, in addition to a school shooting, um, something that occurred at University Mall where they knew who it was and they were trying to um, find the person that needed, needed help from the public. It isn't just from the law enforcement community. Yes, per perfect example that, that, uh, mm -hmm. that suspect um, uh, happens to fall into this category, so. Mm -hmm. So I think that let, um, Tucker has that information and with his uh, magic hands, he will draft it perfectly. Tucker? Uh, something that you may wanna flesh out and discuss. This exemption applies to records reflecting the initial arrest of a person or records reflecting the charge of a person. That's the scope of the records that we're dealing with. And that borrows language in existing law. Those are the records that are public. Everything else is covered by the general law enforcement exemption. So I guess the question that I would have as you're working through this is, do these sorts of press releases that the commissioner has brought up, these public announcements in the public records world, we call these proactive disclosures, do they fall within that exemption category, records reflecting an initial arrest or records reflecting a charge? If they don't, then this exemption is not going to prohibit the release of identifying information. And from what I'm hearing, it sounds like these sort of announcements take place before initial arrest and before charge, and therefore would not be covered by the exemption. Oh. Tucker has very deftly and surgically identified an issue. Uh, there are instances where uh, pre-charge that information may need to go out there are also those that are post-charge. So we may have an arrest warrant. So the initial filing is done, a warrant exists. The person is, uh, uh, is, an, is their location is unknown and they pose an ongoing risk to the community. So there, there could be an intersection with this uh, particular statute that you're contemplating. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Did anybody else wanna weigh in on that? That particular issue? Marshall, I see you unmuted yourself. Sure. I mean, I think that that's actually really, that makes sense. And I can actually think of a few occasions that actually that fit into that category. Um, honestly, I think it's the, the two that I'm thinking of are cases when uh, kids that I've represented have been arrested and then escaped arrest and been on the run. Um, and in the two situations I'm thinking about, there wasn't any, you know, these were not kids who were posing an imminent threat to anybody and there was no need for publicity, but I could certainly see that happening. Um, so I, we have no objection to including some, you know, real clarifying language just to make clear that, you know, if it's a, if it's a pub, imminent public safety risk or, you know, the need to find somebody, that's, that's fine. That's not what we're, that's not what our interest is in trying to protect. Uh, Senator Polina. 
Uh, in the cases of this eminent risk, would we sometimes be disclosing the person, it's him or herself, the name and whatnot, but other times it might just be identifying information like, you know, the person is, you know, white male with blonde hair, that kind of thing, things that we were talking about before we would not disclose, but it might just be identifying information. It could, and Senator, as I understand this, and, and as um, as Tucker indicated, that's probably uh, not subject to this new uh, component. If we haven't identified them, we haven't brought a charge, so uh, there wouldn't be a restriction. It would be only instances, in this narrow lane, it would only be instances where we've, we've begun some kind of uh, criminal or juvenile proceeding. Right, that's right, I, I get it, I understand, thanks. Okay, so um, let's see, we have David Scher, do you want to, um, and thank you for um, people who have weighed in already. It's, this is very helpful. Um, David? Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> for the record, David Scher with the Attorney General's office. Uh, we believe that the direction this is heading in is, is, is good. Don't have any uh, issues with the concept. I think I had one point of clarification, perhaps Attorney Anderson might be able to help us with, um, or I may be uh, misreading or misinformed, but my one question was, um, it seems like in those situations where you have a juvenile, and we're saying somebody, you know, under the age of jurisdiction, within the age of jurisdiction, but where the law says that initial jurisdiction will lie in criminal court for those big 12 crimes where somebody's you know 14 to up to the age of jurisdiction which is due to change soon um uh and initial jurisdiction lies in criminal court for those the um and perhaps it stays there you know let's say that that's the way the proceeding develops uh then the the uh records custodian would not switch to the juvenile court in the way that it is, is um, I believe, is contemplated uh, the way this is structured. And the result would be an odd situation where a public agency remains the custodian. You know, they still have possession of these records. Uh, it is the case that the a lot of the information could, maybe most of the information could be accessed through the court anyway, but the public agency would be left in a, in a situation where they'd be forced to respond that this is exempt from the public records, even though it can be accessed, much of it, most of it can be accessed from the court anyway. It may be that my worry is um, more academic than it is going to be a serious issue in reality because much of the records will be accessible, but it is, I wouldn't want to, put public agencies, including my own, <laughs> in a position where we are forced to say, hey, can't get anything from us um, when people can just get most of the stuff from the court. It, it, it's an odd position to put the agency in. Senator Polina, did you have your hand up or? I was getting a glass of water. I'm all oh, set. OK, OK. Sorry, I'm trying, trying to watch everybody here. It's OK. Um, so. Is there some suggested language around that? Or how do you, um, I mean, I, I guess that is an issue, but um, if somebody can just go to the courts and get it. I don't want this concern to hold things up. Let me, um, because I think it's probably a narrow use case. And, um, you know, again, I just don't want to, put our agency or other agencies in the position of appearing obstructive when in fact, um, and obstructive for kind of a strange reason, like just a technicality, when in fact that isn't anybody's intention behind passing this, uh, this legislation. Let me think about, and, and you know, I'm happy to sort of work with legislative council and think if there's a simple, elegant solution. I don't want this to bog down what is basically a piece of legislation we think is, is going in the right direction. Thank you. Any questions for David? And Pepper, maybe you have some thoughts on that. Hey, uh, for the record, James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. I don't have any specific thoughts. I actually 
I actually liked just the idea of uh, naming the custodian. Um, I know that one frustration that I often have uh, is when multiple departments, multiple agencies um, are in possession of a record and I, I'll, I'll be sitting there redacting a record and all of a sudden some other agency releases it uh, you know, in its entirety, um, even though there is what I would consider to be confidential information that might prejudice uh, a prosecution or or something. So I, I actually really like the idea and I wish, you know, it was more universal um, towards, I, I wish there was more direction for records unrelated to uh, these, this specific kind of juvenile arrest records. Um, but that's a, for, that's a conversation for a different day, obviously. Um, um, you know, I, again, I think that this bill is very much in line with uh, the underlying goals of um, the expanded juvenile jurisdiction and youthful offender. So uh, I think it's just honestly just bringing our public records laws into concert with um, the uh, kind of protections that we've extended to uh, youthful offenders and, and juvenile delinquency cases. So I don't have any problem with the law, uh, the, the draft bill as, as it's written. Thank you. Any questions for Pepper? For James Pepper? Sorry. I just cannot get used to it. I'm referring to you as James. <laughs> it's fine. I actually, I, I mean, very few people other than my mom call me James. So <laughs> whatever, whatever works for, for you all is great for me. <laughs> so uh, Pat, I see you're here. Patricia Gable is here with us. Um, and I know that we're not going into the, the court. We're not going that far. We're kind of stopping here. But would you like to weigh in? Yeah, I, I was mostly interested in uh, clarifying the committee's goals in terms of the uh, civil records that are in the Judicial Bureau. And so based on the discussion, uh, I understand that um, really the proposed bill doesn't have any impact on what I do as custodian of the uh, the records and the judiciary will continue to follow the current law and the current rules. And so I found the discussion helpful in terms of clarifying the committee's uh, goals on that. Thank you. Any questions for that? Okay. Um, I'm looking to see who, have we lost our um, media people? I, Lisa yes. was with us. I don't they, see her. They dropped off, Senator. They have all dropped off. All right, well, is um, does anybody else want to weigh in on any part of what we have so far? And I, think that hopefully we can, um, what, what is next week? We have it, I believe on the, I have too many pieces of paper here. Um, uh, we have this on our list next week for Thursday again to hopefully wrap it up. Does that work? Sounds good. So Tucker, um, if, if the commissioner has some language, you'll work with him around that issue of public safety. And David sure will spend some time thinking about whether he has some elegant language or not. Anybody else have anything that we wanna get in here? And then I will, I hope that we will then be able to make sure we hear from the media because um, Senator Collimore, I did read that um, also that uh, the editorial that was in the in your paper, and um, but I and I, there's just a difference of opinion here, I think. So Senator Clarkson, did you? Oh, uh, yeah. Tyler, yes. 
So sorry, as a point of clarification, I just wanted to make sure, uh, would you like me to return and get back to you with that answer on uh, licensing from our residential licensing unit next week? My, yes, if you, if you could. My guess is that it's going to be the same answer as from DFR and OPR, that it's a conviction, not an arrest. I suspect that too. I just wanted to get it from the but source. Yes, if we could have that, just have that information. And if it's just a, a, mat, a simple matter of sending something to the committee that so that we can have on record that would be great thank you madam chair thanks anything anything else committee no okay um i don't even remember what we're going to next i think at three o'clock we have preparedness. madam chair we're going to the preparedness bill, bill. Oh, yes. Okay. And is that at three? That's at three. So we have a time for a little break here if you want, committee. I will um, say that um, I'm just going to throw this out right now that um, we have the commissioner of public safety has uh, told us that they will have a draft of the agency proposal to us by the end of the week. And has asked because they're in charge of doing all the stuff around COVID that we have a, a joint meeting with house government operations for a walkthrough of the bill of the draft. So we've invited them to join us next um, Wednesday, just so that you know. Okay. And they are um, working on, we had talked about the dates for the reapportionment board to get information to us and about changing that. Um, the house is um, do, going to send us a, a, a session bill that says that. So we don't have to do that until after, after crossover. Okay, Senator Rahm. Madam Chair, I, I have a specific interest in the independence of the Criminal Justice Council for its other purposes than the Academy. And I just wondered if there's past language I can look at. I think you referenced that tried to maintain the independence of the council. Well, well, there's um, the, the Fire Academy, um, the okay. Fire, uh, I don't know if it's called Fire and Safety Council is is independent. The academy is under the agency or under the department now, but the council is um, independent. Commissioner Sherling, did you want? Yeah, the I was going to offer at your discretion, uh, Madam Chair, to Senator Rahm that uh, we're actually working right now to bolster that language in the uh, dra initial draft bill and uh, you'll have mm -hmm. a, an opportunity to tweak that as you see fit to ensure it's uh, it's clear. Yeah. I, yeah, I think we've had a lot of people weigh in on that. Senator Clarkson, did you have? Okay, so should we take a little break and come back at three? Sure.